I grew up in Hoquiam. My folks moved here in World War II. Graduated from Hoquiam High School in 1958. Had an aunt and uncle had a restaurant uptown Hoquiam. My folks had a dry cleaning business uptown Hoquiam. Hoquiam is deep in my blood, as is the Simpson Avenue Bridge. It's a tough town, we're tough people, and that's a tough bridge. And we have deep affection for that bridge. It's so important to keep that bridge open. The businesses uptown, their business drops off drastically when the bridge is down for maintenance. The longer the bridge is closed, the more business that's lost. It's just a vital part of the lifeblood of Hoquim. This is a Simpson Avenue bridge. This structure resides in the coastal city of Hoquiam, Washington, and consistently carries over 15,000 vehicles a day. Timber, steel, and concrete combine to create the 1,980-foot bridge as it spans the Hoquiam River. The low bank of the river requires the bridge to have long, ascending approaches giving the center channel span appropriate clearance for most vessels. Each approach is comprised of timber bents capped with concrete decks and barriers. Next are cast-in-place concrete girder spans with associated concrete decks and railing. Pratt through trusses with concrete decks meet the central channel span, featuring the centerpiece of the structure, a Strauss double-leaf bascule with its signature underneath counterweights. With a 400,000 pound counterweight at each leaf, the double steel decks raise easily in less than six minutes. The bridge was open to the public with celebrated expectation during the spring of 1928. Private and commercial vehicles alike roared across the steel and concrete decks, and not a moment too soon. Hoquiam in the 1920s, and really all of Grace Harbor in the 1920s, was just a really booming place. There was an economic prosperity here that's never been seen since, but one that really made this community what it is today when you look at its built landscape and the structures that still exist here. Promoters of the day referred to Grace Harbor as the lumber capital of the world. And it's no doubt that that was certainly the case. The uh, statistics of the day show that there were 31 different logging firms operating in Grace Harbor at the time, 71 different manufacturing facilities that were making products from wood which included lumber, of course. But there was, there was an infrastructure deficiency here in Grace Harbor at that time. And in Hoquiam, there was one bridge that crossed at 8th Street, which really didn't have the capacity to serve the needs of a growing town like Hoquiam. In the mid-1920s, the population had really swelled. There was a lot of new construction that happened downtown and in other parts of the community, both industrial and commercial and residential for that matter. The downtown in 1924 saw the construction of the Emerson Hotel. The 7th Street Theater in 1928 was constructed. J.C. Penney's built a new department store in 1928. The uh, city of Hoquiam was planning a new city hall to be built in 1929. So things like that that really showed progress and growth uh, meant that there was a, a need for getting people from point A to point B easier. And of course, 
Here in Grace Harbor, we've got a lot of waterways, the Wishka, the Chehalis, the Hopeland River. They all need to be crossed if you're going to get from point A to point B. And so when you look at the very early uh, ways of getting across the river by ferry or later by the 8th Street Bridge, they just weren't up to the demands put upon the town by uh, residents in the 1920s. So in 1928, when the Simpson Avenue Bridge opened, it was really a crucial link that allowed Hoquiam to be the community that its leaders thought it should be. Uh, and believe me, that bridge was put into hard use right from the day it was open. Governor Ronald Hartley was in town to cut the ribbon and he was the first one over, but after that they, they opened it up to traffic and pretty much continuously since that time it's just been used and used hard. Like all bridges, the Simpson Avenue Bridge requires a maintenance program to keep the structure open for use. In addition to scheduled repairs, this program must also handle any unexpected damages to the bridge, regardless of the time of day or night. For years, the Simpson Avenue Bridge has suffered from overloaded commercial vehicles colliding with the truss portals. Collisions have become chronic, causing different degrees of damage to the portal structures over time something had to be done to stem this epidemic harm to the bridge. The time was right for unique solutions. Well, Simpson Avenue Bridge has been damaged numerous times, going way back. But about six years ago, they rehabilitated the bridge and they raised the entire operator house, which gave clearance so we could raise the portals. But again, it was a matter of time and money. We didn't have the time or the money and ready to go in and do anything. But over the last few years, the portals have been hit more and more often. It costs about eight to ten thousand dollars every time. We looked at it and tried to find a time when we could get in there, do some work, do the repair, raise up the portals to keep the uh, damage from continuing to uh, injure the bridge and cost us money. So in 2011, after the bridge had been hit for the third time, we talked to the bridge office. And we asked them to come up with a design so we could raise the portals. Just prior to when they were going to begin the work, unfortunately, the structure was hit yet again. Uh, the damage was significantly greater than previous hits that had been done. The entry portal main vertical members were pulled in an inch and a half, and they were pulled down an inch and a half. We were called out to look at the damage. Uh, consulting with Region, we determined that the main members had to be heat straightened in order to repair them. So we developed a procedure for the Region to use to release the restraints on the existing member and provide heat and a certain amount of external force to encourage the main members to move back to the original positions so that the portal work could continue. Again, we had to get permits to do this because it's an historical structure. So it had to fit as well as possible with what was there. So we met with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. They looked at the plans. They said because of that, we have to do some mitigation. And part of that was to look at the design and try to get it as close as possible to what was there before. So we sent it back to Bridge and they did some rework on the design, so we came up with a design that was acceptable both structurally and for as an historic, uh, fit with an historic bridge. So what we did then is we waited because in October we knew that there was a contract coming up which would require the bridge to be closed. Uh, with an upcoming uh, contract on the bridge for some Pier 2 stabilization, which was going to involve a several week detour of all vehicle traffic off the Simpson Avenue Bridge, we thought it an opportune time to raise the portals, uh, to get them out of the way so they're not hit anymore. We constructed the members of the bridge internally with our bridge and bridge crew. Once we had a set of plans, they could use the plans and they could uh, set up the materials, cut them to the right size, put in the, the uh, bolt holes, get everything set up, pre-build everything ready to go. This was uh, really a cost savings. We could fit it in in between other jobs when we had a little bit of extra time over the approximately three or four months before we actually were able to get out on the bridge. When we had the set of plans, we knew what we were going to do, and we could uh, order the steel, get it manufactured, clean it up, get it galvanized and ready to go. The 
the time came, they closed the bridge. The project office asked us to work first on the Aberdeen end so we wouldn't interfere with the contractor. So we worked there first and then we worked at the Hoquiam end. We were able to get the, ra the portals raised from 14 foot 3 inches up to 16 foot 6. We're hoping that uh, with that the bridge won't be hit, at least not as often. So in the end we're going to be saving taxpayers' funds because we're not out there uh, continuously fixing this bridge. We figure we're going to get our payback in funds within about five or six years. The total cost will be around $120,000, $130,000 to repair the bridge. So we should be getting our return on our investment within about five or six years. Uh, timing was everything and it was an excellent job by Max Crew and uh, excellent cooperation by everyone in DOT to get this done in a timely manner and fit into that contract closure and a uh, very successful project. Raising the portals on the Simpson Avenue Bridge was a very successful project. We were able to use state forces, which saved us money, didn't have to go out to contract. We were able to fit into a contract that was already scheduled and the bridge was going to be closed. This allowed us to work longer hours and to, to save quite a bit of money. We didn't have to pay for traffic control. Uh, we were able to maintain the historic character of the bridge and we'd like to use this process again in the future. I think it's marvelous that the Department of Transportation has maintained this bridge, kept it going, made the fixes that were necessary, and it pretty much looks the same as it always has. So as far as dollar value received for a bridge, I'm sure that that Simpson Avenue bridge rates right in there as one of the longest used bridges in the history of the state of Washington. And with the last repairs, I'd say it's going to last a lot longer. <laughs>